The following podcast is a ministry of Parish Presbyterian Church. And now the word of the Lord as it is found in Mark chapter 1 beginning at verse 40. And now a leper came to Jesus imploring him and kneeling said to him, If you will, you can make me clean. Moved with pity, Jesus stretched out his hand and touched him and said to him, I will be clean. And immediately the leprosy left him and he was made clean. Jesus then sternly charged him and sent him away at once and said to him, See to you, uh, see that you say nothing to anyone, but go, show yourself to the priest, and offer for your cleansing what Moses commanded, for a proof to them. But he went out and began to talk freely about it and to spread the news, so that Jesus could no longer openly enter a town, but was out in desolate places. The people were coming to him from every quarter. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. At the very beginning of Mark's gospel narrative, he tells us that what he's about to declare is good news. By the time he gets to the end of chapter 1, he reveals to us stunningly, starkly, just exactly what that good news is. For the first time, he reveals in the story of the leper who is cleansed, the whole purpose of Christ's coming, the fulfillment of every promise, the inauguration of a new kingdom, glory come into our midst. As we approach this uh, remarkable story, Uh, Let's pray that the Lord would open our eyes that we might behold wonderful things in his word. Father, we thank you for your word and we thank you for the good news of the gospel. And we do pray that now uh, you would enable us to behold it, to believe it, and to walk in it. And for we pray this with thanksgiving in Jesus' name, amen. From 1955 to 1993, Bob Keeshan played a character on a television program that he had invented while he was still in college. He invented this character for a skit at Hillsdale College to uh, to portray some of the paradoxes of his greatest hero, G.K. Chesterton. The name of the character that he created and that he portrayed for all of those years, long before there was Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood, long before there was Sesame Street, there was Captain Kangaroo. After his death, uh, he, he had a A a wonderful eulogy in the Chesterton Review. And uh, he's quoted there as having said, I was attending college on the GI Bill after the Second World War when I first encountered Chesterton. In an upside down, what's wrong with this picture world, it was Chesterton's use of paradox that enabled me to see right side up again. He changed my entire outlook. I began to wonder what a difference it might make if children could have their outlook changed long, long before college. That was the beginning of the idea behind Captain Kangaroo. (laughs) I remember as a child there was was no one that was more important in my early morning ritual besides Roy Rogers than Captain Kangaroo. I, uh, I recall fondly many of the skits and many of the, the regular features, the ping pong balls falling from the ceiling and 
uh, Mr. Bunny Rabbit uh, fooling Mr. Moose all over again, and uh, the, the wacky things that, uh, that Mr. Green Jeans would say. But my favorite segment was always a segment called, What's Wrong With This Picture?, Captain Kangaroo and Mr. Green Jeans would stand in front of a picture and there'd be something somewhere in the picture, a little detail that would just be altogether off. And they would stand discussing and trying to figure out where it was. That was, that was my favorite. I love solving puzzles like that. It's long before there was a Where's Waldo. Back in the days of, uh, of the hidden pictures in Highlights magazines, uh, there was Captain Kangaroo's What's Wrong With This Picture? I c- couldn't help but think of that segment as I came to this particular passage. In the Gospel of Mark, uh, we have this Peculiar story with all kinds of peculiar details. There is a lot wrong with this picture, at least we would think so at first glance. In verse 40, we're told that a leper came to Jesus. The word came there is a word that literally means he approached. It's a, it's a word that most often is used in the rituals of the Old Testament, to approach the altar, to approach the altar of sacrifices, to approach the showbread table. It's it's got clear cultic ritual uh, connotations to it. And then it says uh, that he he cried out, uh, imploring Jesus. Uh, King James uses the word uh, beseeching. He came beseeching Jesus. Uh, Again, uh, this is a, a word that carries with it connotations of Old Testament ritual. It's the cry of the supplicant before the Lord God Almighty. And we're told that he not only approaches Jesus, imploring him, he comes kneeling. Uh, this is a posture of worship. It's actually accentuated in the King James Version. King James says uh, that he came kneeling down to him. He's he's coming in a posture of worship to Jesus himself. And he says, if you will, you can make me clean. That too carries with it ritual connotations. Notice, he doesn't say, you can make me well. He doesn't say, you can heal me. He says, you can make me clean. See, a a leper was someone who was ritually defiled. Uh, Because he was ritually defiled, he was cast out of the community. Because he was ritually defiled, he could not approach people. Uh, No one could touch him. And he comes to Jesus and he says, if you will, you can do what only God can do. You can make me ritually clean. Um, It's interesting. It it says that he is a leper. That that is uh, technical Old Testament language, but it may not be exactly what you think. Uh, Peter Schmutz, in his uh, commentary, says, The Old Testament Hebrew word sara uh, literally meant to be afflicted or struck unclean. Uh, likewise, the New Testament word lepros simply meant to become ritually defiled. So he says, uh, Most linguists, historians, scientists, uh, and scholars believe that both words are used to describe a much broader classification of disease than the more narrow sense related to what we today call Hansen's disease, uh, that horrible disease of of leprosy that literally eats away the flesh. He goes on and he says, 
Uh, any progressive skin disease with whitening or uh, splotchy bleaching of skin, raised manifestations of scales, scabs, infections, and rashes, as well as various house molds or the surface biologic discoloration of any clothing or leather, any and all of these came under the Levitical law of leprosy. Indeed, any ritual impurity could be classified as tasra or lepros. In some cases, these might be early symptoms of what today we call leprosy or Hansen's disease, but a clear relationship between these biblical categories of defilement and Hansen's disease is not established. Leprosy in the Bible thus refers to several skin disorders ranging from severe allergic reactions to life-threatening diseases, as well as various household molds and mildews. So the, the point here is that this man is coming not so much with a medical condition, although he certainly has one. His great concern is that this medical condition has made him a cast off, has made him a byword of shame, has caused him to be defiled. He is unclean. And so... He approaches Jesus in this worshipful way, in this Old Testament ritualistic fashion. And notice, in verse 41, that Jesus is moved with pity. King James says, he was moved with compassion. And he does three things. First, he stretches out his hand. He approaches the unapproachable. Second, he touched him. He touched the untouchable. And then he says what no one can say. I will be clean. A note. Once again, the ritualistic language that's used here. He doesn't say, I will be healed. He says, I will be clean. Now we're told in verse 42, immediately, Mark's favorite word, leprosy left him and he was made clean. He was both healed and restored. We have a clear distinction here. It's not just that he was healed. He was ritually restored. Verses 43 and 44. At this point, Jesus sternly charges him and sends him away. He sends him away, charging him with three mandates. First, say nothing to anyone. Second, show yourself to the priest. And then third, offer what Moses has commanded. And do this as proof, or as the King James Version says, uh, as a testimony to them. In verse 45, uh, we're told that he does three things. He went out. He began to talk freely, but pretty much told everybody. And he spread the news. He disobeys the mandates of Christ and immediately, having been cleansed, runs into the town. The town that he couldn't go in before. And he begins to shout out to the people who he couldn't talk to before. And he begins to touch them and hug them and they dance And rejoice together. How could he be quiet about this? And we're told that the result was that Jesus could no longer (laughs) enter a town. And he goes out to a desolate place. And people have to come to him uh, from uh, wherever they are. From every quarter. From everywhere, literally. To that desolate place. Uh, to see Jesus. What's wrong with this picture? Well, there are all kinds of things wrong with this picture. Uh, Jesus approaches 
a man who should not be approached. He touches a man who should not be touched. He speaks to a man who should not be spoken to. He declares something that no man, no priest, no ritual, no washing uh, 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 cultus uh, could ever do. He declares him to be clean and he becomes clean. The man uh, comes and he approaches Jesus as if Jesus is God. What's wrong with this picture? There's several things. First, uh, this whole posture of worship. Uh, you'll notice that in Mark chapter 1, uh, there are only uh, two occasions where people actually recognize who Jesus is. When demons are cast out, the demons say, well, we know who you are. You are the most high God. And now, a leper seems to know who Jesus is. And he falls down and he worships him. It's all the wrong people. What's wrong with this picture? Uh, Kelly Kerr, in his commentary on Matthew, uh, says this about the parallel passage. Uh, the, uh, the, The word for cleansing. Uh, carries with it all of these ritual and cultic overtones. Uh, the question, though, that should uh, provoke us that it has to do with uh, who the le- leper actually thought Jesus was. But why did he think that Jesus could replace uh, the ritual prescribed by the book of Leviticus? And how was his request for cleansing because he wished to have access back into the town, back into the temple, back into the community? Or because he wished access uh, to, uh, to have access into Jesus' presence? That is, did he understand the significance of Jesus' presence as being greater than that of the temple? Uh, clearly, uh, the leper, uh, leper felt very highly of Jesus as evidenced by his worship and by the fact that the leper uh, con- circumvented the temple and came to Jesus uh, for cleansing in the first place. Uh, Walter Grundemann has said, uh, clearly here, Jesus is the center of a whole new cultus, a whole new ritual. What's wrong with this picture? Another thing is that it is very clear throughout all of the Old Testament that there are strict protocols for dealing with uncleanness. It's one of the central themes of the Old Testament. But over and over again, uh, we see the cry of the Old Testament for ritual cleansing from defilement. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity. Cleanse me from my sin. Create in me a clean heart, O God. And renew a steadfast spirit within me, Psalm 51. There's the great promise of Zechariah chapter 13. In that day, a fountain will be opened for the house of David and for all the inhabitants of Jerusalem, for sin and impurity will be washed away. And in Ezekiel 36, we have this great promise of redemption. And moreover, I will save you from all your uncleanness, and I will call for the grain and multiply it, and I will not bring famine upon you. You will be washed. You will be cleansed. This is the great promise that runs all through the scriptures. In fact, one of the things in the Old Testament that we see that really reinforces this notion is the way the world is categorized. Whether it's land or peoples or food or animals, the whole world is categorized into these three different divisions. There are the holy things. Uh, like the temple, or the priest, the, or the sacrifices, or the showbread. There are the clean things, like uh, the land of promise, and the people of promise, the food that, uh, 
by kosher laws, mosaic law, you're allowed to eat the clean things. And then there are the unclean things. Unclean animals, unclean foods, unclean peoples out in the world, the flesh uh, and the devil. Uh, The whole idea of creating these categories is uh, for Israel to constantly, every day, run up against ordinary things and see God's perfect plan of redemption. See his grace and his mercy uh, to come and restore every broken thing and to remind them that there are Standards. There are patterns. There is a protocol uh, for restoration. That everything was to be a picture of redemption. So unclean animals, for instance, are all animals uh, either that have their flesh that literally is in the dirt or they eat dirt. That's, that's what an unclean animal is. It's a reminder that the earth is cursed and we need to be separated from the earth. That's why a hoof, a separation uh, from the earth is clean and flesh that touches is unclean. It was just a picture of the brokenness of the world and the call uh, to walk in the ways of the Lord, which is redemption. It's not health and hygiene. Uh, This is a picture of redemption. So in in this story, we, we have an opportunity for us to see all of those rules of cleanness and uncleanness, of purification, uh, come to the fore. Uh, All of the rules and regulations of Leviticus chapters 11 through 21, or Numbers chapters 5 and 14, or Deuteronomy uh, uh, chapters 14 and 26. But that's not what we get. That when something is unclean, It can only be declared clean by the high priest. The priest has to be the one to declare it. And there are a whole host of steps that you have to go through to move from being unclean to clean. There's a specified waiting period, for instance. Different kinds of impurity require different waiting periods. Uh, And then after the waiting period, if a priest declares you clean, uh, then at that point you undergo washing rituals or uh, various kinds of sacrifices. All of that seems to be bypassed here. What is going on? Uh, Jesus then tells the man that he needs to go to the priest and observe all of those rituals, offer the sacrifices according to the Mosaic Code as a testimony to them. In other words, he's to take the evidence that this marvelous thing has happened outside of the temple precincts uh, by someone who is not recognized as a priest, And they're to bring this as a testimony right into the temple for the priest to see it as a testimony. You see what Jesus is doing here? He is claiming his crown rights. Jesus is declaring for the first time, yes, I am the fulfillment of every promise. Yes, I am the great high priest. Yes, I am the one who has come to restore every broken thing. We read it a moment ago from Hebrews chapter 1. He's the radiance of God's glory, the exact representation of his nature. He upholds all things by the word of his power. When he had made purification of sins, he sat down at the right hand of majesty on high. In the healing of the leper, Jesus is setting in the stake. He says, this is why I have come. I have come to claim my father's kingdom. And it starts here. I will be clean. In uh, 1 John chapter 1, uh, we have these incredible words. If we walk in the light as he himself is in the light, 
we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. The great high priest exercises the prerogative uh, that only God himself can exercise in exacting the healing and declaring the cleansing. This is what the Apostle Paul is talking about in Titus chapter 3. He saved us not because of deeds that we have done in righteousness, but because of his mercy by the washing of regeneration and the renewing of the Holy Spirit. That's why in Hebrews uh, we're told, uh, let us draw near with a sincere heart and full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled clean uh, from an evil conscience and all our bodies washed. This is all Old Testament language. Jesus did not come to violate the law. He comes to fulfill it. He comes to satisfy it. He comes uh, to declare that he is the law. That's what this story tells us. It's interesting. No ritual, no sacrifice, and no priest could actually make someone clean. If someone was ritually defiled, but once the defilement was cleared up and once they had taken uh, the appropriate steps and gone through the waiting period, they would present themselves to the priest... And the priest would examine them to see if they were clean. In other words, the cleansing has to be done by God. It can't be done by the priest. But then the priest is the one who declares the ritual cleansing. So what Jesus has done is he's taken the place of Yahweh and he's taken the place of the priest. He's declaring himself to be both. And then... uh, Notice this last thing that is wrong with this picture. The leper, who was before a cast-off, a byword of shame, untouchable, unapproachable, so defiled that he actually had to stand off at a distance, and if anyone came near to him, he had to cry out, Unclean! Unclean! The leper now made clean, runs into the town. He's hugging, he's talking, he's telling everyone. Meanwhile, Jesus cannot go into the town. This is a beautiful picture of double Imputation. Jesus is giving us an early glimpse of what the whole of redemption is about. A double imputation is where Jesus takes his righteousness and he puts it on us. And then he takes our wickedness and he puts that on him. And he pays the penalty for our sin. It's what the Apostle Paul was talking about uh, when he said, uh, for our sake, God made him who knew no sin to be sin so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. What's wrong with this picture? Absolutely nothing. In an upside down world, it's the gospel that enables us to see right side up. Here, Jesus gives us an early glimpse of the glory of the gospel. This double imputation, this glorious transaction where he is sent out into a desolate place where we belong. And we who were unclean are now made clean by his grace, by his mercy. The leper approaches Jesus 
as if he's the throne of grace. And then he beseeches for grace to be poured out upon him. And he kneels in worship and submission before the grace is even extended. And then Lord Jesus, having compassion upon him, says to him, I will be clean. That is the whole story of redemption. That's our story. What's wrong with this picture? (laughs) Not a thing. Not a thing. This has been the Parish Presbyterian Church Sermon Podcast. For more information about the ministry of Parish Presbyterian Church, please visit www.parishpres.org.